history and visual analysis. In particular, we will be answering and exploring the questions at the top. What is art? Who makes art? Where is art? And how do we even study art? And these are really, really important questions to begin um, a, a more in-depth introduction to this course. I think it, this the purpose of this lecture is to orientate ourselves. Um, a lot of you I know maybe ha have not had an art history class, hasn't really engaged with vis visual culture um, before objects and images um, in the art world. And so I always like to present um, a little bit of a meteor introduction about um, how, how is art history and visual culture discussed? Who are the key players um, in, in those disciplines? And what, and what is visual analysis, which is something that you all will be doing a lot in this class. And why is it so important to, um, to the disciplines that look at the visual world? So let's begin. Let's start with what is art, which is a very, for such a simple question, it is very difficult one to answer. Uh, and that's why, it, and that's because it is hard to define. How do you define art? That, that would be the response to what is art. And the definition um, for, uh, is very blurry in it of itself, right? So why is art so hard to define? Number one, ideas about art change through time and space, right? They don't, it's not a stable definition. Um, one definition at one, t at one point of, of time in one particular place might be different um, in that same place in a different time and or around the world, right? Um, it, um, art is also particular to culture and context. So um, the definitions for art could um, be wild, widely diverse um, uh, across to time, space, culture, context. So what that means is what is art? Well, that is a very blurry thing indeed. It is a very unstable definition. Next, one person's art might not be another person's art. You, you might look at one image and your friend might be looking at the same image and you will think, wow, that that's art. And they will say, no, I don't get it. That to me, that's not art. So very subjective, right? One person's idea of it might not be another person's and vice versa. So uh, on the individual level, um, it is also right a very unstable definition. And uh, the the last well, kind of the last point of why art is so hard to define is that often in art history um, and in history in general, things originally in the, in the culture and context that it was created might not it wasn't considered art to begin with, but then later on, it became appreciated as art, right? And uh, once again, showing how unstable those terms are. But what can we say? Um, art is a shared human inheritance that harnesses creativity and in ingenuity to create objects or images. Um, and art always conveys meaning because it is created by humans, humans that come from a particular culture, a history, an ideology. And um, art is, it conveys meaning, but this meaning can be expressive. Um, it's showing something that uh, that doesn't necessarily have words, right? It's trying to visualizing something in material, or it can be functional, right? Something very useful, or it can be both. It can be both expressive and um, and functional, which we do see examples of that. And lastly, art does not have to be appreciated to be art. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be valued to necessarily be art, which is, is a little bit of a mind bender, um, but it's something we will we'll be thinking about in this class of, you know, uh, how does art exist, even if people don't necessarily, you know, see it as art or appreciate it as art. Next, I'm going to talk about some ideas that we will avoid in this class, and, and these are just common things that I've come across in my um, many years of, of teaching art um, that students present, um, and, and just some ideas that I think we, we want to expand upon. We want to go beyond, um, and the first one is, I don't think this is art, and that very much goes back 
to that subjective quality, right? That, you know, if you don't think something is art, that doesn't mean that it isn't art and it doesn't mean that we can't appreciate it or, or we can't uh, at least appreciate it in, in this class context, right? That we can uh, analyze it, we can examine it and we can try to understand where this object or image is coming from. We're also going to avoid terms like beauty and ugly, right? These are very uh, quali uh, you know, qualitative. Um, and usually things that are say that they're beauty, you, there's this connotation that it's good. And if it's ugly, that it's bad, right? And once again, very subjective and very hard to define. Like how, how can we define beauty? What makes something beauty? A beautiful or ugly is very up, it's to the eye, the eye of the beholder, um, so to speak. Next, we're going to move beyond um, the word uh, ideas of progress and advancement, right? So through the, the you know, beyond that conception that one, through, once you go through the chronology of art and time, that things get better or um, art gets more advanced, right? That's not the case with art history. Um, as we will see, um, the way that images look and the way things are constructed is all about what the culture is valuing at the moment. And maybe to us, to our eyes, it seems like it's maybe a little simple and not as you know complex as something um, that 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 is not a, 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 an effect of progress or advancement that is just what that culture was valuing at that particular time which changes and so once again all of these ideas are very subjective and do not account for the many ways art is appreciated and valued by diverse communities and cultures so next we're going to move on to who makes art well you, you this is this is a no-brainer artists right um, and we think of the, the term artist as a title uh, that is a single person, but artworks are typically never created by just one person. Even today in contemporary times, artists have teams, uh, they have interns, they have apprentices that help them. And also they have representation, right? People that promote their artwork, galleries, critics, right? So um, the term artist is a little, um, is a little deceptive because it, it, we think of it as a single person Person, but a single entity, but it is actually a, a, a very large group. Um, and so that idea of artist as, you know, this single genius, right? And here Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa is a great example of someone who is the iconic genius artist. Um, that, that idea was very much uh, first explored during the European Renaissance of the 16th century, which is Leonardo is part of that um uh, that group um and this was very much due to the artist's efforts to elevate their profession the, the to be an artist as something that was cerebral because that wasn't always the case um in, before the 16th century so what was before artists um usually were pa were be were paid by patrons right individual families um who pay for art either for their own collections or for public display um but it was very important that they patrons you know are showing their money their wealth their power by funding art by artists right and so so we think about this now chain the artist is is basically commissioned right for a long time by wealthy individuals um, for art that serves religious functions military functions secular functions etc and the Marode altarpiece is a great example of this because we have a very classic religious scene of, of the Virgin Mary at the Annunciation, which is where she is told that, you know, she will be the, the you know, the mother of Christ, right? Um, and then we have Joseph over here working in the workshop. And then we have these figures um, to the left. And these are actually the patrons of this altarpiece. And it was very much... Um, a, a point that they have their portraits placed in this scene, not only to show their own piousness to this particular, you know, Christian religious scene and, and purpose and function, but also to show, right, that they have power, they have wealth and, um, and, and piousness um, behind them. 
And so the Merode altarpiece was very much created in, in the space of the guild, right? So before artists became these single geniuses, quote unquote, um, artists were artisans and worked in guilds. Um, with other with and they were really they were really seen as trades people and and merchants um, and they and, and and creating art was very much a craft not a quote unquote big a art right um, and so when uh, at least someone like Leonardo is elevating himself he's elevating himself from the guild right I am no longer just a nameless face in a building and here's a wonderful image of the weavers guild in Augsburg Germany um, which just so happens to be where my mother is from um, it's a very beautiful place very well known for the guild these guilds have these wonderful patchwork uh, colors um, on them but uh, but once we get into uh, going through time um uh, the art uh, the artist as the single person we start to see, we start to see actual schools of art right so very similar to how we have today if you want to go to art school you go to a, a you know a kind of academic institution where you learn how to do art in a very particular way and these are the academies of art um and these are institutions that are primarily geared to instruct artists, um, but they also do other things. They have very important exhibitions, right? Shows that showcase the artists in, in the academy, um, as well as if we're thinking about the history of the academy of arts, especially in Europe, um, if, if mature artists um, were, were accepted as members and they could take part in that process of, of teaching new students. Um, and what we get with academies of art, what, what um, is actually a, the standard, a kind of a standardization of how to do art, right? Uh, academic art tends to look very similar because a lot of these artists are being taught the same way of, of, of doing art. And then we have non-professional artists um, doing art that is often uh, called vernacular uh, art. And um, it, so it would be a mistake that only you know, trained artisans, trained artists, people who go to art school can do art, right? No, um, there, there's a you know, wonderful art produced by non-professional self-taught people um, and that is just as much admired and significant. And here's an example that I took um, from a wonderful um, museum in Roswell, New Mexico, and it's the Miniatures and Curious Collections Museum, where um, this, this group who created miniatures, so miniature houses, miniature fairs, miniature parks, um, you name it, just the very small, but, and they did this by hand together, and they're the Los Pocos Locos Miniature Club. And so very much, a, 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 you need to be very talented to do something like this, um, but these are made by people who, you know, if we're thinking about those definitions of art, some people might ne not necessarily consider this art, but it is very much art indeed. So where is art? Where does art live, right? So now we know who, how is it, who makes it? Where does it occupy? Well, it occupies a lot of places. Humans really like to showcase their art. And one of the, one of the big ones is spaces of worship. So churches, temples, mosques, right? And so we see art in these contexts, um, you know, in, from different faiths and the art is used in, in different ways. So for instance, we have the Virgin of Guadalupe on the left um, from the Basilica of St. Maria of Guadalupe in New Mexico City, right? Very much a very, very typical um, uh, image of, of the Madonna. And it's really there for, you know, contemplation and worship and devotion, right? Um, that you, you stand, maybe you light a candle, um, you, you pray to the Virgin Mary, right? It's very much related to a ritual practice. Versus, if we look at the right, this very, very old um, synagogue, synagogue, Jewish um, uh, synagogue of, from Dura Europos, um, which was a, a city um, in, in East Asia, in, in present day Syria, that was, um, you know, very, very much a trade stop on the Silk Road. And because of that, we had a, lot, a very diverse religious community. And here in the synagogue, we have artworks that are very much there to, you know, be admired and, and worshipped, but 
but they are telling a story. Notice all of these panels are really showing different scenes. And the goal was to teach. This is an, an, a, a use of the image as an instructional device, right? Religious, but used in a slightly different context. Art has also lived in what is called uh, called princely collections, which I really like that kind of, it's a little bit of an antiquated term, but that just means privately owned art. So people who buy art and they display it um, and, at, at, in their homes typically. Um, and if we're thinking about the history uh, of art, um, if we're thinking about you know the art that you see in museums now, um, a lot of those, that, those artworks were from these princely collections and they were called princely collections because they were owned and well, purchased and owned by very the very wealthy so very wealthy aristocrats very very wealthy nobles monarchy um and, and even you know merchants that got very wealthy um, from trade and they would they would buy art they would fund art and they would display it in their homes but after the princely collection, right? So, well, we have a series of revolutions that happen in Europe um, that dispel, you know, the monarchy and create these, you know, democratic and people uh, ruled um, governments. So, what do we do with all this art? Well, you know, we create these these museums, right? The birth of the museum very much came out of the revolutions, right, of the 18th century, right? And usually, like the Louvre in in the Louvre Museum in Paris, which was a former palace, um, the King's Palace, now is a public. Uh, depository for um, artworks that were in the collections, but now museums are also purchasing uh, their own artworks to fill. But the but the the shift is that now it's public. It's not for private eyes. It's for public eyes. And so for museums, that that is a very important to educate and to provide a, a general public with um, with you know historic uh, objects and images. We also have permanent storage, preservation, and conservation. Um, uh, uh, artworks, uh, like like most things, decay over time. You know, they have to be continually cleaned and monitored for them to stay around and be displayed in museums. And so sometimes um, artworks live in permanent storage for a very long time because maybe they are very far gone and they actually can't be out in the oxygen and in the air, right? Um, and, and sometimes they're there for a certain amount of time to be cleaned, which is, often takes a very, very long time because it's a very tedious task. And here's a great image of conservators at the J. Paul Getty Museum in LA um, doing that, of, you know, they, of looking at it and usually they have documentation of well the last time it was cleaned this is how it looked and they have pictures to reference and they see if, if anything has you know decayed and what needs to be touched up so it's a very interesting profession um, and another place where art lives also public spaces you all probably have seen murals around art on the street on the sidewalk um, and art can live there it is a very a uh, popular place for people to do art. And of course, Banksy is a very, you know, who, who made himself famous as an artist who did these, um, you know, temporary uh, murals um, around um, urban, typically urban centers. And here, Girl with a Balloon, which is one of his very, very early, um, early works um, is, is an example of that. And so hopefully you can see that, you know, art is actually everywhere. <laughs> um, it, we can't really escape art. And if, if our de definition of art is blurry to begin with, you will see that, you know, going to a mall, um, you know, buying, buying clothing that was designed by someone, going to the supermarket and seeing all of the, the design there and the graphic design, the billboards on the side of the road and even you know looking at an Instagram um, grid you the art it can be everywhere um, and that makes art very to me very engaging and fun um, thing to to discuss. So then how do we study art? Well we study art by looking at subject matter, context, and visual analysis. 
First, and with subject matter, we have several things that we can talk about with um, images and artworks. Number one um, is representation. It's a very big uh, definition. So representation is also known as objective art. And what that means when we say something has representation is that whatever this object is doing, it's visualizing a clear or accepted subject matter, meaning that it's something that you can recognize, someone can recognize it. So for instance, this is uh, Michelangelo's um, Pieta, right? So another religious scene with the Virgin Mary, but this time we have Christ right after um, he has died on the, cruci the crucifix, right? And so when we say this has representation, we say, well, I see fig human, bo human bodies. I can tell that this, you know, uh, we have a female figure, we have, uh, you know, a male figure, and that, you know, we can tell that, you know, he's not doing so well, right? He doesn't look, he doesn't look alive, right? And we can make sense of this despite even beyond just knowing its its context and function. We can say, you know, well, we can see that there's there's um, there's sorrow in the face of of this female figure, and she's holding this figure as if uh, that you as you would hold a child or a, a baby, right? So we can get a sense. Well, maybe you know this is definitely her son because of the way she's acting, right? We can all our our brain can all we can figure this out right so this is something that has representation it's very clear we're not confused about um, the elements going on in the opposite, on the opposite spectrum, opposite of representation is non-objectivity, right? So if representation was objects or images that have a clear intent and they have clear subject matter, um, uh, non-objective non works um, deliberately make it difficult for us to identify. We don't really know what we are looking at. We can't identify it. Um, it blurs uh, be, it being recognizable, right? But then it also kind of maybe come, maybe something comes to mind. You know, when we look at something like the like untitled rope piece by Ava Hesse, who is the artist who I actually did my dissertation on, um, very much calls to mind. Like for me, I look at this and I say, I don't know exactly what I'm looking at, but it call, but to me, maybe intestines, right? Or or, or ropes or weaving, um, different things that I, I, I have seen, but it's not necessarily referencing it directly. It's more our mind is wandering and connecting the shapes and the texture and the materials to other things we've seen. Um, and not on a, a non-objective art often does that. It, it calls to mind something else uh, that lives out in the world that we our minds are kind of bringing in. Um, thing, it, the same thing with, with clouds, right? When you look at clouds in the sky, it's very common to start to see shapes and figures in the clouds, right? That cloud doesn't really have a shape, right? It is just a cloud. It is just air, you know, it's water vapor, but our minds are bringing, bringing to it um, images that uh, help us try to make sense of this um, very irrational, chaotic uh, form. We also have abstraction. Abstraction is very important um, word for uh, this class. And these are works that either simplify, emphasize, distort, or rearrange visual elements or formal elements of an artwork, right? So, um, and, and this can be either representational or non-objective. And I gave you an example from the Romanian art uh, sculptor, Constantine Brancusch, The Sleeping Muse. Um, I would say that this has representation, but it has abstract representation. Why? Well, we can see that it is a face, right? We can see a mouth, we can see nose, we can see uh, the ridge of an eyebrow, we can see uh, the eyes, right? Um, we, can, we can tell that this is a human face, but this human face was not a natural face. This, is, this isn't how human faces look uh, to us when we see faces in the, in, you know, the, the world. Um, because Brancusch has abstracted the human face. And what, ha and what has he done? He has greatly simplified um, the face. And by doing so, he's very much emphasizing certain elements. So, I, you know, I would say he's emphasizing the hair by um, simplifying, you know, the, the actual strands of just these very hard lines. He's emphasizing this, the, the surface of the face by making it very flat and smooth. 
right? And so that's what we mean by abstraction. So going back to some to something like this is also has abstraction as well, right? Um, it's simplifying, it's emphasizing, um, it's it's creating very simple um, forms, uh, be it you know organic or um, or geometric. And then we have naturalism, which I just mentioned, right? So the kind of the opposite of abstraction is naturalism. And these are works that represent the world as close as possible to how we experience it with our eyes in, you know, a real environment, right? And so this this is not to be con, um, confused with saying that this is, is re realist, right? That this is real, which realism, which is its own term and its own movement within art history, which we're not gonna get to, um, which isn't necessarily the same as naturalism. And I love uh, talking about uh, Jean-Francois Millet's The Gleaners with naturalism because why is it natural? Well, he's looking at these gleaners who are um, uh, female uh, uh, laborers who their job is to pick up the stray hay that the, the machine that came through uh, did, did, didn't pick up, right? So, the, and, and so Millet is showing them at, in the act of, of, of this work, right? That you get a sense that if you were there um, in the scene wa wa watching them, that this is exactly how the movement and, and the, how they did their job and how they looked and how it would be, right? And we get a sense of how a backbreak, literally backbreaking this work is and how tedious it is because it has a lot of naturalism. And then we have context. Um, and so this is this is moving on from subject matter. And what is context? Well, this is information about a society, how the society worked, who ruled it, and what the core beliefs and the society are. Right? What are the what are the important symbols and and ideas of of the society? And with context, you do need a little bit of back knowledge, right? Of of a culture, right? And so you know that's why in this class, you know, we're taking this class because we are going to get a lot of context because that gives us a lot of information information that helps us read and understand uh, a particular image, right? Um, and it, it illuminates why an image was made and um, maybe even reveals something that at first glance isn't so apparent. And so this is Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, right? And so looking at this just right off the bat, maybe some of you have seen this, this painting. It is a very famous painting. But if you just didn't know anything about the context, you could get some information, right? We see see a French flag, right? So we see a French flag. So, okay, this has something to do with France. Um, Eugene Delacroix, that is a very French um, name and it's in the Louvre. So it probably is important in some way to, to France because of all of this information. We see a lot of, of violence and warfare going on. We see smoke, guns. We see deceased individuals in the foreground. Um, and so, okay, so something is happening, some sort of, of conflict, right? And, and that's great. I mean, that is actually very much what's happening and part of it. But it, it is also important to know the context of when this is, when, when this was made and why this was made. And this was made um, in the context of the French Revolution, right? I talked about those revolutions um, um, earlier with the, the birth of museums and especially the something like the Louvre. Um, and so now we have, we can look at it again. We can see, well, wow, okay. Um, it, what we know about the French Revolution is it was the people um, are usurping the monarchy, right? Ruled by many um, versus ruled by the few. And we can see that. Look at all of the different types of people in society we see in this image. We see a young boy. We see a very, uh, you know, um, nicely dressed gentleman. We see people who, who look like, you know, laborers, we see uh, all types of people, right? So we can get a sense of, oh, that's why Delacroix is showing that this re revolution is very much of the many, right? Um, against against um, uh, the few. And then we have our central lady figure. We, we can see her, she symbolizes liberty. So, oh, in the context of the French Revolution, right? She is symbolizing that move, right? That move for freedom um, that was so important to uh, that revolution, as well as, you know, the, the U.S.'s own revolution against um, the, the, the United Kingdom. 
And then lastly, we have visual analysis, which is also known as formal analysis. And what this means is the arrangement of all the visual elements in an artwork in addition to its material. So how was it made? Was it made from oil? Was it made from um, egg whites? So, you know, what? Because that also gives meaning and structure to how uh, an image or object looks. And so we think about things like composition, line, shape, perspective, color, scale, all of these really wonderful visual terms which we will be talking about in this class. And visual analysis is very much like the grammar, like grammar in writing and speaking, right? Um, these elements are a vocabulary that organize principles um, that, uh, and, and, and organizing principles that allow for us to be able to talk about objects and artworks in a very detailed, exacting way, right? You can talk about, well, the line here is doing X, Y, Z. The color is adding to X, Y, Z. And here is a um, painting by John Copley, Watson and the Shark. Um, uh, uh, and a very f a kind of famous American painter. And there are two versions of this painting. One lives in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and the other lives at the, in, in Boston. And because Copley uh, lived in Boston, and um, and, I, and I've seen that version in person. And so what we have, you know, we have a very interesting scene. We have this shark, right? Um, we get a sense that this is Watson. and. He's he's not having a good time with this shark. Uh, he he might he we might be seeing the end of Watson here in the foreground. But then we see this boat in, in the harbor, and we see the these these men right these different men who are desperately trying to save uh, poor Watson, who is very desperately uh, putting his hand to the sky and looking very terrified at that shark. And so if we're thinking about just purely the visuals, we can really pick apart um, and, and, and interpret this artwork and without, without really knowing anything about the context um, or subject matter. And so for instance, notice, right? Look how um, the uh, Copley has placed all of these uh, individuals. Look, look how much of a strong triangle it is, right? Um, and, and that um, is a very academic, right? I talked about the academic, uh, uh, you know, these academies. That's a very academic way of, of organizing a group of people in a painting from this time. It allows for, the, for some visual interest. It's there to capture you know, your eyes. It's because it's in the center of, of the painting itself. But then the, the triangle also allows for the line. So if we're thinking about a triangle it is made by uh, three lines connecting, right? You can follow along the, that, that line um, all the way around that, that shape. And we can do that here. And what do we see? Well, look at this. The spear is on one side that's about, and it's focusing us to see the shark and it's about to impale the shark and then then we look and the shark's mouth and eyes are looking at Watson and then we they, we're connecting it through his arm and then we see that the arms reaching out here are now the other side of the triangle and we have the hands here and so what this is doing right if, if, if we're thinking about visual analysis is that this triangle and this line is allowing our eyes to just go through all of this entire scene and see different parts of the narrative and uh, in interpret what's happening in different ways, right? So if you start here, you say, oh, okay, the, you know, uh, the, the emphasis is, oh, the, this, this shark is going to die, right? So we have to, we have to kill it, um, right? Um, but if you go the other way, you, you go on the opposite end of the narrative. You start with, well, Watson fell into the, the, the water. Everyone's freaking out and someone is desperately trying to stop the, the shark, right? So just by choosing which side of the triangle to follow, you get slightly different entrance into uh, the narrative itself, right? Um, and because I had a student ask, well, why is Watson na uh, naked? Uh, why is he nude? Um, which I think is a great question because, you know, yeah, why, why is he if everyone else is fully clothed? Um, well, that, and we'll talk about this in this, in the class of, um, often, um, male nudity and in particular male nudity has, has historically been used as a way to show, um, heroic vulnerability, right? So heroes, um, and this goes back to ancient Greece, um, were, uh, were shown nude to show, um, their heroism, their, the, the, their, their power, 
their their male power and their virility and and their vulnerability and these and nudity in, in different contexts has has also conveyed that through time and so we could say that on one hand that it's trying to show something about Watson maybe something about his valor or his heroicism um, in, in this vulnerable state. So that's it for today. Um, I hope that you 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 got an, another little taste of of what we're going to be doing, and um, I will talk to you soon.